Hey guys, I'm Luke Smith from Bungie, and today we're gonna talk about your questions on this episode of Destiny Support. The first one is from Matt BFC72 Gmail1, which I'm a little worried that that might be a password of his, but let's get to his question. I think Bungle should reinstate a loot cave somewhere just for the hell of it. You can see how many people are willing to grind that shiz. Well, the loot cave was a pretty fun time in Destiny 1. And what it showed us was that the game that we shipped in 2014 was a game that people wanted to play and that it also wasn't rewarding enough. What we've tried to do with Destiny and now Destiny 2 is make the game feel pretty rewarding so that standing in front of a cave, shooting into it, isn't the best way to play it. The loot cave questions continue. What if Bungie never patched out the loot cave? Would we all still be sitting in front of that cave farming engrams? Even though I hope not, there's like a little part of me that thinks there would still be some people standing in front of the loot cave, shooting into it and hope that something amazing was gonna come out of it. And so we, we did it. We did it to prevent that from happening. Since the Black Garden is the requirement for carryover, could the stranger's rifle be Destiny 1's remembrance piece for original players? I think what you're asking about here, Sam Kuwitz, is how is Bungie going to remember that we played Destiny 1. We have something we're planning. We're not gonna talk about it. I'm not gonna spoil it here. But when the game comes out on September 6th, you'll find out for yourself what I'm talking about. Will there be any Destiny 2 perks for players of D1? And will you need to buy it on the same platform for them to work? You're gonna enter the world a little differently than people who didn't play D1. Will you need to buy it on the same platform for them to work? The answer to that is yes. If you're an Xbox player in Destiny 2 on Xbox, we will remember and, and show you that we remember when you boot up the game and enter the world. Question, colon. Did the wizard really come from the moon? Or was that just something you guys said to get people interested? We talked a lot about this one internally. We think that the wizard did in fact come from the moon and what we didn't do a good job of was communicating that the wizard came from the moon, like giving it a different name, like moon wizard or lunar wizard or something like that. We'll try to do better. Scathlock Auto Rifle is the best gun in the Destiny 2 beta that had two E's, yay or nay. There were only a couple of auto rifles in the beta and it was just a tease. Scathlock is a kinetic auto rifle, which means it's gonna deal bonus damage to players' weak spots, their, their critical zones, their heads. So if a player is just running around, not in their super, Scathlock might have been the best auto rifle in the beta, but our energy weapons, we also had an auto rifle, I believe in the beta. So if a player was in their super, you know, running around, like running around throwing shields, like, you know, Captain America, then that auto rifle probably would be better than Scathlock. So the answer to this question really is about the answer to how we think about the sandbox for Destiny. I hope Scathlock's amazing. I hope it ships and it's an incredible weapon and people love it. But I hope it's got times when it's really great and times when you wish you were using something else. If the Awoken weren't created until after the darkness arrived, why does an Awoken Guardian not know what happened to the Traveler? <sighs> this is a tricky question because it sort of lays bare the timeline and the questions that the timeline can create. So I'm gonna talk about one particular part of the timeline, the collapse. And we chose the word collapse at Bungie very specifically. We were trying to indicate that not only did society collapse, but it also sort of, you know, jet like jettisoned humanity back into the equivalent of a sort of dark age. So not much is actually remembered at all from this time. And it's it's very deliberate. Why does the Queen of the Awoken have my haircut? If this picture is representative, this individual's hair has since grown out since this question, so this might be a bit of a deep cut. One of the ways we think about character creation is how, uh, how are we creating a character who can be you know, cosplayed by people who love our game? So choosing those characters' hairstyles and their coloring and the way, they're, they're, the way their zippers have little things on them. It's just humbling to see any character from our game world that someone spent a bunch of time to, to like dress up and embody. It's, it's, it's always amazing and the team gets super excited about it. I wanna know how the Taken King and the Vex play into the war against the Red Legion, Main. That is M-A-Y-N-E. Uh, that's a word that I'm probably not allowed to say because I'm too old, but because it was in the question, I, I read it and I committed to it. While we were building the Taken King, we had an idea about what was coming next and we knew it was going to be about the Cabal. We had a mission where you learned a little bit about the fact, I believe the mission was called Outbound Signal and the Outbound Signal was in fact a signal, I believe it was a signal from the Cabal ship that crashed into the Hive Dreadnought that was beaming a signal out to the Cabal Empire. With respect to the Vex, 
The Vex don't play specifically a role in the, the conflict between the Red Legion, but while you're playing through Destiny 2 and while you're playing a bunch of the different content, we are pointing at places we're going to go next. Part of the fun of making and playing games is seeing that intention and knowing that it's all, it's all going somewhere. FMJ underscore steward asks, my name is Bife, popular YouTuber and lore master. What do you think about Cade being on the Vex planet in Destiny 2, stuck in a portal, looking for the stranger, or Maya Sundaresh? I can answer this one. Cade is actually looking for neither of those things. He's trying to figure out a way to solve this Gaul problem. In the opening of the game, in the first mission, Homecoming, which people played in the beta, Cade talks about, you know, he's gonna go find the person who caused this and it's gonna be a short date. That didn't break well for Cade. He, he ended up heading to Nessus to try to figure out another way to uh, leverage technology because he doesn't have his power anymore so that he can take on Gaul. And so it's not about the stranger and it's not about Maya. It's about Cade doing the thing that I don't think people expected him to do, which was be a hero. How does Destiny look so realistic? The Destiny visual style is a testament to the amazing team of artists that we have at the company. Like we have a visual style for our worlds that dates back to, to Destiny 1. We, we describe it as nature ascending over humanity. A bunch of awesome stuff happens. Like you have giant bosses and you have like characters throwing magic bombs and you have those guys summoning golden magic pistols. And so we want to have that, but at the same time, we want things to be grounded. I'll be frank. Why should anyone get Destiny 2 on console for anything but PlayStation 4? other than, quote, I don't own a PS4, I'm gonna be frank. The best place to play Destiny 2 is in the place where you can play it with people you wanna play games with. Play wherever you want, but just play with people. Wise double underscore, I got a rogue Ikora here. You know, and if she falls over and people are gonna think I like disrespected her or something, so I'm not gonna hear the end of it, so she's gotta stand up. I'll fix it. Yeah, fixed. Any change to the player fantasy? Do Titans feel like walking tanks? Hunters like acrobats of death? And warlocks as floating butterflies? Do you want a job? That's what we try to do. Um, so the hunters, with the new subclass, the Arc Strider, we tried to make uh, an Acrobat of Death. The Warlocks with Dawnblade are floating butterflies. And the Titans, we hope, do feel like walking tanks. So if you want to feel fast on any class, what you want to do is find armor that prioritizes mobility. If you want to feel like a walking tank, you're going to want to find armor that prioritizes resilience and recovery, no matter what class you're on. What we've done was we've made the stat ranges on these statistics in Destiny 2 matter more. So people in the beta talked about, you know, my character doesn't feel as fast as, as he or she felt in, in Destiny 1. So if you want to be like a race car warlock, there's totally a build for that. I'm not gonna tell you what the stuff is in it because I don't wanna ruin the surprise, but if you wanna go fast, you can go fast. This is still wise double underscore wolf, so I'm just doing two at once. Any word on recovery, armor, or agility? Did they throw that out or refine it so that it matters? Could we just run the same answer I just gave and just run it twice? That would be awesome. How do you think having power weapons instead of both special and heavy affect the PvE endgame? Definitely affects the PvE endgame. One of the changes we've made is we have now characters. Previously, we've, we've called them majors, which is the word we never wanted you to like have to understand as a player. But any character you're fighting whose health bar is not like the boring, like simple red version, like the baseline version of the unit, any one of those characters that you fight is gonna just drop power ammo for you. Suddenly, that creates an interesting game and it creates a prioritization game when you're playing in something like a strike. By adding the sort of deterministic way of getting ammo, it lets us design experiences. So we do hope that, that when you're playing the game this fall, you can see that intention. I think ultimately it's gonna be, it's gonna be super fun for players. The elemental mods on the elemental weapons makes me think we'll be able to change damage type? Yes, it does. It doesn't mean that you'll be able to change all the damage colors, like for your exotics. It does mean that that you will be able to look at a hand cannon that you love and be like, oh man, I'm gonna I'm gonna change this to 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 solar because I know that this week the the Cabal Strike in in the Nightfall playlist has a bunch of guys with red shields. I don't think this was in the beta, but 
when you pop the shields and they match in, in the shipping game, so if you're shooting a red shield with a red gun, it creates this pretty large AoE explosion that deals damage not only to the character whose shield you just popped, so they take sort of double damage on the shield pop, but also stuns the character, so they like f freeze and you just can keep shooting him. But the AoE will also blow up a bunch of the creatures around him, so that damage match game becomes more important and more fun. Next one. Can we hope to have private matches on Destiny 2 in the first few updates after launch? What we're gonna be doing when the game comes out is we have an internal... I'll fix it. We're already thinking about adding to the game. We have like, it's like a, a, you know, a list of features. And then the game comes out and the best laid plans explode. So it's really hard for me to say right now, yes, yes, private matches are coming in the first few updates after launch because the plan is gonna be modified. The deal is gonna be altered. Uh, sometime after September 6th, when you all out there get your hands on our game. Hashtag Destiny 2 thought, colon. Do you think Bungie possibly begins utilizing something like PTR on PC to test updates with players before they go live? So PTR, for those of you who aren't, aren't, aren't like attuned to the Blizzard language, means patch test realm, where we go and play the latest content, or we play sort of a future update, and we're putting the putting the game through its paces. We have talked a lot internally about the possibility of opening something like this up to, to player groups. And honestly, I like the idea of players not totally knowing everything that's there before the game comes out. And while I think that Test Realm and like private test beta, if we expanded that, would be amazing for a bunch of things like stability, I'm, I'm still interested in challenging us to do our best job without having to expose it to the public. I wouldn't say never, but I wouldn't say yes. I don't know how to get that done to 140 characters. It's tough. I'm liking the look of hashtag Destiny 2, but come on, at Bungie, why remove the grimoire? Two steps forward and one step back, winky face. Now, Stubbs, I think you and I both know that's a passive aggressive winky face. I believe it was at DRE where this first thing leaked, this um, this notion of a lore tab on, on a bunch of weapons. That's one of the elements, that's our version of how do we replace, how do we replace the thing players love about the grimoire? And what I think the thing that players love about the grimoire is it's extending the universe of destiny. It's it's giving it more teeth. It's, it's giving you more to, to grab onto. We don't feel like it was necessarily taking something away, but rather reprioritizing the time that we would spend on doing something out of the game to put it in the game, rather than just the subset of people who go to our website. We like lore too. And the best way for players to experience lore is for them to experience it in the game client. I think the Titan is the best class in the beta so far. Multiple slams is OP. Who's your favorite and why? My friends and I played a bunch of competitive. We played a bunch of countdown in the beta. And for me, in a mode with objectives, it was hard for me to have more fun than dropping big walls while I'm playing. The Titan class ability, I think it's like towering barricade is what it's called, but that's a mouthful. So I just call it big wall. But there's a path in the gunslinger tree that I think is pretty much the best we've ever seen for hunters in PvE. It's called the Way of the Sharpshooter. And the way that it works, each hit of your golden gun can now do precision damage. Okay, so you can, you can critical hit with golden gun. Successive precision hits of golden gun deal more damage. And it doesn't have to be on the same target. So you could, you could hit something with power A and then A plus one and A plus two. Now the next thing that it does is each precision hit creates orbs for your allies. So if you're a good golden gun shot and you pride yourself on precision, the way of the sharpshooter is the highest orb generation class that I've seen in the game to date. Now, I'm not gonna just like ignore the warlock either. There's a path for the void walker that I just call the devour path. And this is a path where the void walker gets to put him or herself into a state. It's called devour. And when devour is active, which I can do two ways, I can do it by like consuming my grenade. I can eat a grenade or with a melee kill where you just like bop a guy and kill him. Either of those things will set you into the devour state that any kill will start to heal you. And of course, when your super is full, you get to throw the, um, the Nova bomb and this Nova bomb on the bottom tree travels much faster than the, the Nova bomb in the top tree that was in the beta that I affectionately call Slova bomb, but I believe the game calls Cataclysm. So can't buy talent. I kind of take the coward's way out on this one. I honestly don't really have a favorite. I sort of move between the characters, you know, based on my mood. But for me, I'm gonna have a couple of day ones because I'm gonna have 
the console day one in September, and then of course, I'm gonna have the PC day one in October. And the thing I will promise you is I will play two different characters on each of those day ones, but I bet you by the time the PC comes out, I'll have leveled all three of the characters already. Because I play a lot of the game. Can't you tell? At so sweaty. If the Dawnblade can kill a hunter and Golden Gun with one strike, why can't the hunter do the same with one Golden Gun shot? Dawnblade has a travel time, which means it's dodgeable. So when you throw the flaming sword, it moves and it, it can be avoided. It's not a it's not like an instant hit projectile from range. Golden Gun is. I believe this is probably just going off of the beta. And so this is just looking at the six shooter talent. A precision hit with Golden Gun will probably kill the Dawnblade Warlock. So you might be looking for the way of the sharpshooter. What is the best power weapon in the Destiny 2 beta? He's linked a YouTube clip here. And I bet you it's just like someone doing unfair things with some power weapon. If I was to guess without watching the clip, without making it play behind me, it might be a fusion rifle. The fusion rifles were a little hot. They were a bit strong, and so we are gonna, we're gonna tune them down just a smidge to bring them in line with the other power weapons. We've looked at things like Sniper Flinch and Sniper Sway and have tried to, tried to reduce that. We've done things like increase rocket launcher damage against the monsters. We hope there isn't a best uh, when the game ships. I mean, the one, this one over here is pretty good. It's called the Wardiff Coil. So no more dubious volley. It's a power weapon. You call it the Wardiff Coil. That's its name. I don't think I understand what a power weapon is in the Destiny 2 beta. Is it a heavy? Is it a secondary? Capital W-T-H is it. A power weapon in the beta is a weapon that has no ammo when you spawn and all the ammo for it is located around the map. Now in the PvP game, these weapons are all pretty much one hit kill weapons. Very effective, they're super lethal, and you don't have access to them all the time. We want to make combat engagements be more like gunfights rather than, rather than what they've been in the past because we are an action game and we're a shooter. What a power weapon is, is it's an opportunity to win. It's a big opportunity to win. It's a temporal advantage. It's like a power play in hockey in a bunch of ways. Like, you have the advantage. Titans have mobile fists of havoc and hunters have golden guns. Why don't we have a mobile Nova bomb for Warlocks? Like three to four smaller bombs. Like three to four smaller bombs made of fire like swords. Could that work? Because you have that. Can we, can we call that good? Let's call that good. What weapon are you guys gonna miss the most in Destiny 2? Double question mark, hashtag Destiny 2. I'm not gonna speak for the whole team. I will only speak for myself. It's a weapon that I wanted from the moment we created it. It was a weapon that when I got it, uh, I stood up in my living room and let out a yelp and a fist pump and my golden retriever looked at me like I was a lunatic. It is a weapon that was found in Destiny's first raid, the Vault of Glass, and it came from the Templar raid boss. And its tool tip is delivering the inevitable one trigger pull at a time and its name was Fatebringer, and I will miss it forever. Legitimate question, can Cade 6 even eat ramen? Do Exos even eat? I didn't ask a version of this question internally, but I did ask another question about Exos' capabilities, because I did wonder, you know, it's a robot. Like, is it, I, like, is it all, like, is it all robotic? Yeah, you know, like, the answer is index for fun, and so, like, of course, yeah, Cade of course can eat ramen. Like, of course he can. Cade can eat anything that you can eat, and I guess he really likes the spicy ramen. I, fun fact, I don't like spicy things because it gives me heartburn. It makes me upset, it makes me grumpy. Will Cade 6 have a bigger role in Destiny 2? In the context of how big the game is, Cade has a part, and he shares that part with the two other members of the Vanguard because we wanted to give each of them their own sort of arcs in the game. In terms of objective, does he have more stuff to do in this game than any Destiny game previously? He does. And it goes further because Cade, just like the other members of the Vanguard, has a little role that they play in the cyclical game, which is the game you play after the campaign. If Gaul listened to music, what type of music would he listen to? True story. I actually got some folks from the team together to talk to them about this question because I wanted to know the truth. The answer was music that would make him feel superior. Suggestions included things like jazz, prog rock from the 60s or 70s, like, 
you know, maybe Gaul's really into Rush. Although, in my head, if I were Gaul, I think I might listen to some of that stuff from Moana. I really do. Moana's good stuff. You should check it out. Quick question for Destiny lore people. Why does Lord Shax have the Raze Lighter Sword instead of the Guardian in canon? Well, in canon, you and your ghost were not at the tower at the time of the attack. Shax just has his all the time. And also, like, it's a glowing, flaming sword. Like, you want to look at the guy and be like, yep, what's the coolest thing we can give him? Well, we're not allowed to give him a lightsaber, so what's the next coolest thing? A sword that's on fire. Let's do that. It looks sweet. You didn't have yours. Yours was in your vault, along with all the rest of your stuff that the guy listening to smooth jazz blew up. We're sorry. Well, I mean, he is. Wow, Luke, you did a really good job. I think I could have done a better job. I don't know, I think you did really good. <sighs> I tried. We'll see you with a whole bunch more this fall on Destiny 2, and thanks for watching this episode of Destiny Support. <laughs>